Hello Frizzle followers! My thoughts on Desert Sphere in just two words. Slogtastic flashbacks. I enthusiastically and wildly loved book one of the series. And then I read this book too, and it was quite a contrast to my feelings on book one. Book one set up this expansive, beautiful world and culture where there are these demons that spawn every night, and then there's all these different kingdoms, and you have to learn warding magic to protect against the demons, and we had a bunch of different point of views, and it was fantastic. And then here in book two, I have identified four major problems that I would like to rant about now. And yes, many of the strengths of book one are still present in book two, I would just say that the problems are larger. And if you want to hear me talk about the strengths of the series, you can go watch my video about book one, and link to that in the footnotes. But book two, The Desert Spear, starts out literally the first third of the book following Jardir. Jardir was a minor character back in book one, who was only significant because that's when he betrayed our hero in a critical time for the hero's arc. But now we get Jardir's whole childhood leading up to and a little bit past that moment. And it's not that I haven't enjoyed villain origin stories before, or it's not that I don't enjoy flashbacks, it's just that these flashbacks were boring. Because Jardir didn't change significantly throughout any of this really, the further world building of the culture he's in, which is Krasia, is a uh, sub-problem, is part of this problem, which I'll get to in a minute, but I think my real bug with this first third of the book and Jardir's chapters was that I couldn't find it in myself to root for Jardir. Not just because he had betrayed one of my favorite characters of book one, but because who he was throughout the entire flashbacks. It wasn't a character that I enjoyed, it wasn't a character that I could root for. His motivations of just kind of becoming the best, the strongest, the leader it wasn't something that I could really latch onto or help him root for. And so for the first third of this very long book, I was just waiting for anything else to happen, anyone else's perspectives, anything to change, please can we get something else? And we didn't. And I can't even advise that you skip the first third of the book because there is actually a lot of important world building culture expansion that happens here, and that is problem one, sub problem two, which is the culture of Krasia. There are a few different cultures in this series. Most of them seem to be based off of generic renaissance-ish Europe except for the country of Krasia, which is very clearly Middle Eastern inspired. In book one, Krasia had some pros and some cons. For example, one of the things that Krasia was really valued for and was awesome because of, Krasia was the only nation that was actively fighting against this demon threat, and there's a lot to be admired in that. And you would think that diving into the culture of Krasia more deeply, we could get some more positive things about their culture like that. But instead, what it did was twist even the things that I admired about the culture back in book one into more negatives. That this brave, admirable warrior culture turns out behind the curtain, training child soldiers. Hope you like your generational boot camp trauma. And every new bit of Krasian world building we got, the more I just kind of didn't like the culture, which I feel like is a real shame and kind of feels like Islamophobia, given that all the other cultures in this series, they get to have positives and negatives, but the further we delve into Krasia, the more just pure negative it is, which is sad, and again, made it really hard to enjoy those chapters. And now, the Leisha problem. Leisha is a fantastic character in book one, because Leisha is a wonderful bundle of both strengths and weaknesses. She's very driven, she loves learning, she loves defending people, she has a big heart, and she cares for people deeply. Leisha also falls in love too quickly, often overreacts to people behaving mean to her, is very haughty and proud. And she gained some wonderful practical skills in book one, like healing. Now in book two, she becomes pretty much all strengths, and the number of skills that she acquired in book two, once I listed them, is absolutely staggering and absolutely unrealistic, and I think at this point she has become the Mary Sue, where nothing is difficult for her anymore, she can do no wrong, and she has now become annoying. <laughs> Here is a list of skills that Leisha has not only acquired, but mastered to expert level by the end of book two. She's got her normal healing stuff, which I'll give her. People can have a few wondrous talents. But now she also has the warding magic, being great at sex, 
top tier hand to hand combat skills, learning languages ridiculously fast, understanding politics and being great at political manipulation, and being an awesome leader. I don't think any of these skills are ones that I would have pegged Leisha at being particularly good at. Like, like her book learning could easily go towards learning languages and being a warder, but suddenly being like the top 1% of these skills? Why is Leisha suddenly like this? It feels like she's only being what the plot needs her to be instead of actually being who she is. And the fact that she has been stripped of a bunch of her weaknesses, except falling in love too fast, which we'll get to in problem three, without having to really work to overcome them, just makes her arcs feel cheap and her not feel like a real character anymore. She has become flattened by the Mary Sueness, and I am no longer emotionally invested in Leisha. The marriages problem is our problem number three. Leisha and Jardir are falling in love. As stated with problem number one, I hate Jardir. As stated with problem number two, I now also hate Leisha. <sighs> so at least they deserve each other, I guess. Roger also gets an arranged marriage plotline. And, and it feels like we've stepped in to a soap opera that is only populated by characters that I dislike with relationships that don't feel real or contributing to the plot or themes. And the fact that the first third of the book I didn't like, and then the third third of the book became this. <sighs> I was really, really hoping for a plotline that could rescue this book. And what I got was these weird arranged marriage plots <sighs> that didn't fulfill the character journeys for any of these people or really contribute to the larger plots. Except I guess if there was a marriage, that would be a plot point. And because I've already received Jardir's backstory, where his relationship with his many wives is honestly terrible, makes it even less shippable for me to put him with Leisha, except as a punishment for Leisha, I guess. Now, there was one will they won't they love plot in the last third of the book that I did like, and that was between Arlen and Renna, because it contributed to both of their character arcs, where Arlen needs to learn to embrace humanity and social culture because he's been kind of a hermit wanderer for a while. And getting a sidekick and love interest in Renna fulfills that need for him, and him choosing to accept her into his life gives him that room to grow and make that choice. Ren, on the other hand, needs to get out, see the world, have a stable relationship, but also feel like she can take care of herself. Traveling with Arlen gives her all of that. Because yes, Arlen can give her a stable relationship where he can take care of her, but he also emphasizes training her to take care of herself, and so that fulfills her need with her emotional trauma that she's trying to get over. And so, the relationship builds the character arcs and the plot forward. That one was good. The other plot lines could learn something from this one. Our fourth problem is the looming demon prince threat problem. <laughs> so from the beginning of the book, it has shown that there are these looming psychic demons that are going to come and wreak havoc. And though they do show up, they are more the B-plot handily defeated and only there to serve as a catalyst for more of the arranged marriage plot. I forgot about this. They're like telepathic and they're egging people on to cause more drama in the arranged marriage plot. <laughs> I can't believe I forgot to mention that as part of the marriage problem. It's all, it's all intertwined. It's all one big problem this book is. And because these demons are just kind of like looming background threats for pretty much the entire book, and then their actual antagonistic force is so small and almost tangential to the love plots, it's like this book didn't even have an antagonist. The closest thing this book gets to a real antagonistic force that's working through the narrative is the force of Arlen's non-humanity and him shunning social life, which he does wrestle with. And as I said, that was like one of the parts of the book that I actually liked. And those special psychic demons do have the sense of setting up for future books. But you can't just have your antagonist only be setting up for future books, because that's just not how you make an entertaining book. And so this book left me frustrated, annoyed, bored, hating many of the main characters, disappointed about the lack of good antagonists, and just overall feeling very put out, especially because of my wild love for book one. I rated this book two stars. If you want to see more book videos on Frizzle Fridays, please subscribe and put your favorite love-themed emoji in the comments. Thanks for watching.